Hi and welcome to this lesson on electropotentials. In the last lesson, we had a look at half cells, we learned about dynamic equilibrium and about redox systems and redox couples. So we learned that two half cells, we can connect those together to make a full electrochemical cell using external wire and a salt bridge. And this allows us to measure the potential difference between both of those half cells. So in this session, we're gonna look at electropotentials and how we can work those out and calculations involving those. So first of all, we're gonna learn about what an electropotential is, what it means, and then we're gonna learn how to measure and calculate electropotentials. So we learned in the previous lesson that in a half cell, we have a dynamic equilibrium established between two species that are part of a redox couple. So they're linked by the gain or loss of electrons. So we learned that we can put a metal strip in a solution of those ions. That's one type of half cell that we can make. And we call this value, and we can set up a, a potential difference between two half cells. There are different ways of creating those. And we call this value an electropotential and it's measured in volts using a voltmeter. And the greater the tendency for a metal to lose its electrons, the greater that potential is going to be. And we cannot measure the potential of a single half cell. We can only measure the potential difference across two half cells. And those two connected together make a full electrochemical cell. And to compare the ability of different metals to lose electrons, we're going to learn now about how to set up a standard electrode that we can connect to all half cells. So here's the all important standard half cell that we use. It is the hydrogen half cell. So this image here is showing you a full cell, but this left hand side is the standard hydrogen half cell that all other half cells are compared to. So the hydrogen is going to enter as a gas. So I'll add that in here. So we've got H2. I'm telling the reader that it's coming in as a gas at the hydrogen electrode. So there's my hydrogen electrode on the left hand side. And it's inert. Oh, it's not inert. Of course it's not. We've got an inert platinum metal here. So platinum and it's inert. So it could be solid platinum foil. And we learned before why we use those electrodes when we're using non-metal gaseous uh, parts of a redox system. And that's what's required. And the electrolyte of the half cell is going to be a solution. This is going to be a solution of H+. Plus. Of course, it's going to be aqueous. And on my other side, I might be comparing it to, for example, a zinc half cell. So I would have my solution of my zinc there as well. Now we're going to learn about standard conditions. In order to get a reading from this, it has to be under standard conditions. So my gas has to be at 100 kilopascals, which is very close to one atmosphere of pressure. The temperature that this is happening at has to be 298 Kelvin, which is approximately about 25 degrees Celsius. And my solution of my ions has to be one mole per decimeter cubed. If we don't have those conditions, we're not going to be getting that standard reading from our voltmeter. It's essential that you learn the conditions, the standard conditions for the hydrogen cell by heart. The standard hydrogen electrode is given an, a standard electrode potential. This sign here means our standard of 0, 0.00 volts. And you'll notice I've done it to two decimal places. You should always give your electropotentials to two decimal places. And the electropotential of all other half cells are measured against this standard. So each half cell will be connected to the hydrogen half cell and we can get a potential difference, a value between the two. They are always written in tables as a redox reaction by default. And in order to make them comparable, they have to be measured under standard conditions, as we discussed before. So we always have to have our ion concentration. They all have to be to one mole per decimeter cubed. Our temperature, as I showed in the previous slide, is 298 Kelvin, which is approximately 25 degrees Celsius. And our pressure is 101 kilopascals. Now 100 is acceptable on a lot of specifications, so check your specification, uh, which is one atmosphere of pressure. Again, you need to learn all of those conditions by heart. Electropotentials that are measured under these standard conditions and against the standard hydrogen electrode 
they are referred to, or the values that come out are referred to standard electrode potentials, which is this symbol here. They are always, as I said in the previous slide, written by default as reduction reactions. They have to pick one, that's the one they've picked. And an essential thing that we must remember here is a more positive value of our standard electrode potential tells us there is a greater tendency for reduction. Okay, and therefore a more negative value for our standard electrode potential is equal to a greater ability or the greater the ability of elements to be oxidized. So if you learn these two statements, it's going to really help you with your calculations and selecting the correct equations later on. A reminder of what we are talking about when we discuss reducing and oxidizing agents. So a reducing agent supplies electrons to another species and an oxidizing agent removes electrons from another species. Another way I like to think about it is a reducing agent, it, the opposite happens to itself. So a reducing agent itself gets oxidized and an oxidizing agent itself as a species gets reduced. In this table, I've got my standard hydrogen and we can see that of course it's zero. If I connect two standard hydrogen electrodes to each other, we're gonna get no difference, it's just gonna be zero. Whereas if I connect a copper half cell to a hydrogen half cell, the reading, the difference between the two will be plus 0.34. So all of these are examples of when two half cells are made into an electrochemical full cell, and we can use the standard electro potential to decide how to set the cell up. So we're going to be able to work out which cell is most likely to be oxidized and which cell is most likely to be reduced using these values on the right hand side. Things that affect those values of the standard electro potential are going to be temperature, pressure and concentration because they are going to effectively change the position of the equilibrium of that redox couple in that half cell and if the position of the equilibrium is, in sh is shifted in favour of the forwards reaction for example the reduction then the electro potential is going to increase that value you're going to have is going to increase and vice versa. If the equilibrium is shifting more to the left, so that's showing oxidations happening, then the value of our electro potential is going to decrease. It's going to become more negative. In those cases that we've just discussed, if we change the temperature, the pressure or the concentration, we're no longer under standard conditions. So it's really useful that we've got an equation that can help us work out the electro potential of a half cell when it's not standard conditions. And we can use this using the Nernst equation. So my electro potential, notice I don't have the theta symbol there because it's not standard anymore. So my electro potential is going to be my standard electro potential plus RT over ZF ln the concentration of my oxidized form, it's quite a long equation, divided by my concentration of my reduced form. Now check your specification as to whether you need to learn this equation. What do all these symbols mean? So this is going to be my electrode potential. It's no longer standard of course, hence it hasn't got theta, but this is my standard electrode potential. I'll put pot there. And R, you've probably seen R before in some of our other equations. It is our gas constant. So 8.314. And then we've got our temperature. It's going to be hard to fit this in. So temperature, and that is going to be measured in Kelvin as always. But Z, that's new. So Z is the number of electrons transferred. And then F is our Faraday constant. See if I can fit that over here. That is in C, mole to the minus one. And Lun is our natural logarithm. 
hopefully you recognize that and we've got our square brackets here which mean our concentration and they're going to be in moles per decimeter cubed here's a question to have a practice at but i'm going to work through the answer shortly of course i'm using the table that i gave earlier on in the lesson and here we're going to look at which cell has the most positive um, electrode potential so the reaction with the most positive potential will process in the forward direction and the reaction with the least positive so least positive i should put most there will proceed in the reverse or the backwards direction let's then work out the actual reactions that occur so we've got lead here and here i'm showing that it is being reduced so undergoes reduction so it's placed on the left-hand side, and then I've got zinc, and here I'm showing it undergoing oxidation. So luckily, my electrons already cancel out. I've got an even number of electrons on the above and the bottom, so I can just add these two equations together. So I'm going to want to balance those equations so that the electrons cancel out, they already do, and then if I add them together and cancel those two electrons out on both sides, then we're going to end up with this reaction. And I'm going to be careful to make sure I add in my state symbols as well. And there we go. We've got a full ion equation for the reaction. Here's another practice question. Again, I'll go through a worked example, but pause the video if you want to give it a go first. When we're talking about identifying the strongest and weakest reducing and oxidising agents, it can get a little bit mind boggling when we're looking at these tables. We're having to reverse things in our heads. So let's take it step by step. So first of all, I have identified that this equation here, minus 0 0.6, oh, 76, is the most negative. Okay, it's the most negative electrode potential. So the reverse reaction is most likely to occur. So zinc is the strongest reducing agent. Which means it's the weakest oxidizing agent. Okay, then from my... Copper electrode, if I just remind you of the equation here, because remember, we always default write it as reduction, 0 0.34. Now, this is the most positive electrode potential in the table. So this reaction, the forward reaction is most likely, okay, in this particular case. So Cu2 plus will be the strongest oxidizing agent. That's what that means. So let's keep going. Therefore, what we can say here, the reverse reaction is least likely to occur in that second reaction I showed you with the copper. And copper is least likely to be oxidized. So that means that copper is the weakest reducing agent.